Okay, um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar um, on school absenteeism and the poverty-related attainment gap. Um, my name is Donald Christie, um, retired now, but still um, vaguely connected to the University of Strathclyde. Um, and it's my privilege to be kind of moderating this event today. I'm going to say just a few things uh, to open up. First of all, I'm delighted to welcome the uh, very varied uh, and diverse audience we have today. Lots of um, people from different groups, different stakeholder groups, um, some university colleagues, uh, some uh, colleagues from local authorities, some from schools, some from local authority organizations themselves. We have many colleagues joining us from um, third sector, um, groups who are interested in um, the poverty related attainment gap in one way or another, family issues, um, pupil issues, etc. Um, we have even one or two individuals joining us from other countries and welcome to them too. Um, it's an important event, uh, given the, the context that we're in. Um, the issue of absenteeism uh, has many, many ramifications, and it's a very complex issue, as we'll discover this afternoon. Um, I read a headline this morning on the uh, BBC World website, uh, quoting UNICEF, UNICEF's figures from um, their analysis of the current situation, obviously um, affected significantly by the COVID situation, um, 400 million children uh, adversely affected by COVID closures. Now, um, there's a major, major challenge that all countries are facing right now. Um, it's a but the challenge of absenteeism clearly predates COVID. Um, the, the problem, of course, with COVID arriving is that it's exacerbating um, issues that were already being experienced. And of course, as ever, the issue of inequality is further compounded by every new challenge that, that comes along. And this is where we have to focus our efforts um, in order to try to address this um, persistent problem that we have with inequality in educational outcomes um, and educational opportunities. Um, and, you know, we're, it's not as if it's a new set of issues. We, uh, the Scottish Government has prioritised this for a number of years now. Um, the key to addressing this is to acknowledge the complexity of the situation, but to really engage with the issues at hand. And we, we are uh, fortunate today in having the opportunity to hear about the cutting edge research going on um, that uh, here at Strathclyde, Marcus and Edward taking forward the, the studies with funding from ESRC and more recently by Nuffield Foundation. Um, but it's also fantastically important that we have the engagement of other partners because the need for collaboration uh, to address these issues has never been greater. Collaboration is a, a topic that is close to my heart um, and um, it's been a focus of my own research. Uh, collaboration as a, a means to learn more effectively, but also collaboration as a model for research and for interventions um, across uh, the educational kind of sphere and beyond, because collaboration has to be a widespread thing. And we have that reflected in the contributors today. Uh, we have Laura Robertson, joining us from the uh, Poverty Alliance. She's Senior Research Officer um, and you know, author of a very important report just um, a year or so ago um, 
on the kind of whole uh, issue of how we address the poverty uh, related attainment gap. Um, addressing this is a, a major challenge and you know clearly what uh, Laura's work was able to do was to um, highlight the complexity of this and some of the things that need to be taken forward. We also have as a presenter um, Gillian Robinson joining us from uh, representing GTCS. Obviously the, the importance of the teaching profession in mediating some of the interventions and so on um, can't be overstated. And uh, so we have um, the research, the engagement and the issues being addressed that will enable us hopefully at least to identify fruitful lines to follow to try to tackle this problem, um, acknowledging its complexity, but not um, kind of giving in to the challenge that it represents because it's an, an essential part of any strategy to take things forward to address this um, persistent poverty related attainment gap that we um, grapple with these challenges and today is an opportunity uh, to get our teeth into some of these issues. So um, I look forward to um, listening to what's being said but also to the contributions that you all make uh, and please do um, enter your questions, the issues that you would like the speakers to address um, into the chat and we can, uh, we have opportunities uh, twice uh, during the, the proceedings and then again at the end to address your questions. And I think it's very important that uh, we have the opportunity to do that today. So um, we're going to kick off, first of all, with Edward. Um, and I'll pass over to you, Edward, to give us the, the first of the presentations. Thanks very much, Donald, and thank you for that uh, really wonderful introduction. And hopefully we'll live up to, uh, up to that introduction in our, our presentation. Uh, so I'm going to share a slide. Um, okay, welcome everyone uh, to uh, this uh, research seminar or webinar on school absenteeism and uh, poverty related attainment uh, gap. So just to uh, give a bit of uh, context, well, I will uh, talk briefly about the ESRC project and its context. Um, and then for this particular presentation, we'll look at family uh, socioeconomic status and school absenteeism and also discuss some of the implications uh, from uh, that research. So the uh, project is titled Family Background and Educational Attainment, an Investigation into the Mediating Role of School Absenteeism. And this is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council Secondary Data Analysis uh, Initiative. So the original uh, the period of investigation was from 2018 for an 18 month project, but we've had uh, several no cost extensions as a result of uh, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, which has had a knock on effect on data accessibility. So for the team as led by my colleague, uh, Marcus Klein, and I'm a co i on the project and our current uh, research associate is Esmir Lely White. We've also had uh, previous um, uh, team members, uh, research associates, which is Shadrach, who is now at uh, Dundee University, and Claire, who is now at uh, Glasgow University. And we're also very fortunate to have had uh, the support from uh, our non-academic partners, uh, mainly the General Teaching Council for Scotland and Poverty Alliance, and some of the colleagues are here today to present but we'd also like to appreciate uh, the critical uh, support and the critical question that uh, colleagues such as uh, Shalene Simpson, who is currently now at Aberdeen uh, University from the GTCS and Fiona McHardy from Poverty Alliance have played throughout uh, uh, the, the process. So we have some peer review outputs and that will be list, uh, listed and in the shared slide. So uh, that's uh, not a, a problem. So just to give you a bit of context and the context that helped uh, the framing of our research. 
So one of the main uh, uh, things that uh, we observed at the time was that our un unexplained absence is, had increased from 0.7% in 2005 6 to 1.7% in 2018 19. And an aspect that uh, received quite a lot of uh, interest within the media was unauthorized uh, absences due to school holidays, uh, because this also increased from 0.4% uh, on average in 2006, 5-6 to 0.7% uh, uh, in 2018 and 19. A clear observation in that data, and these are all Scottish-based uh, uh, data sets anyway, a clear uh, observation was inequalities in school attendance or inequalities in school absenteeism uh, based on socioeconomic uh, status. And within Scotland, uh, neighbourhood dep deprivation is used as a clear marker of uh, 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 these inequalities. And what we saw from that data was that uh, children from the most deprived neighbourhoods were almost about more than uh, two times more likely uh, to miss school compared to those from the least uh, deprived uh, uh, households. Another thing we observed uh, uh, subsequently and during the school closures and after schools uh, reopened was that uh, there was an increase in school ab absenteeism, which is the top uh, uh, graph, overall increase in absences after schools were open, uh, 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 after the uh, initial closures. And these increases were due to both COVID as well as non-COVID uh, related uh, reasons. So our overall aim and our overall question was to uh, uh, try and dig into this uh, family SES and educational achievement uh, relationship and to look at the role of school absenteeism in explaining that uh, uh, socioeconomic status and educational uh, achievement relationship. So I mean, our motivation was driven uh, by the knowledge that there are SES gaps in achievement, and this is kind of well documented. Uh, the literature also uh, uh, indicated that there were SES gaps in uh, school attendance, and uh, attendance was related to achievement. However, except in very few cases, most of these studies come from a US context, and we're interested in looking at a Scottish context as a complement and to look at whether there are uh, similarities or, or differences. The other limitation in existing uh, uh, research was that the multidimensionality of both socioeconomic status and absenteeism was rarely taken into account. A lot of the studies when looking at socioeconomic uh, differences in school attendance focus on free uh, school meals or free reduced price lunch as uh, in a, a US context. And also when they were looking at, at, at different forms of absences, the focus was mainly on authorized as well as unauthorized uh, uh, school absences, mainly focusing on these broad categories. And we were quite interested in looking at more defined and precise reasons for school uh, absences. Our hypothesis was that these precise reasons, as well as these specific forms of uh, socioeconomic status, can give us some idea of potential mechanisms by which uh, socioeconomic status uh, influences uh, 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 school attendance. So for, for example, if we found that maybe uh, uh, in, um, income related measures of SES were related to absenteeism, that could give us an indication that family income and income related measures are quite important. Whilst if you look at uh, uh, parental education as a much stronger association, then we could say that some sociocultural uh, uh, factors are more uh, important. So for our study, we use the Scottish Longitudinal uh, uh, Study, and this is a large-scale anonymized linkage study using data from current Scottish administrative and statistical sources. For our specific uh, uh, research, we draw on the census data, so we used uh, the 2001 and 2011 census uh, uh, for, for this particular study. We also use uh, school education data, so this is linked to the uh, census data, and school education data uh, consists of school census, attendance and exclusion data, as well as school achievement uh, data from the Scottish uh, Qualification Authority. The Scottish Longitudinal Survey is designed to capture 5.5% of the Scottish uh, population, 
It is a sample that's selected using 20 semi-random uh, birth uh, date. The SLS also is able to link uh, NHS uh, health data, but this is not part of the core SLS uh, uh, database. And for our study, we uh, actually use some health related uh, data uh, to undertake some uh, robustness checks. So for the cohort of SLS uh, sample we use, we use two cohorts of students. Uh, in S4, and S4 for colleagues who are not familiar with uh, the Scottish education uh, uh, system, S4 is the fourth year of secondary schooling, and it is the end of compulsory schooling in uh, uh, Scotland. And these students were followed into S5 and S6, which is the end of secondary schooling uh, in a Scottish uh, context. Another important thing to mention here is that we chose these particular stages because it is at these stages that you have uh, uh, high stakes uh, 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 examinations and high stakes achievement data. And because we are interested in looking at that link between a school uh, attendance and educational uh, outcomes. For our study, we only selected participants who were present during the census in 2001 and in 2011 when we are looking at post-school destination. So for 2001, that gave us an opportunity to look at uh, parental socioeconomic uh, uh, characteristics and other background characteristics of interest. And for 2011, that was when we we're trying to look at post-school destinations overall, because by that time, these individuals would have transitioned from school into either labor market or further education. We also only selected participants uh, 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 whose um, mothers or fathers can be identified from the household uh, information and where SQA records are available. So for our first study and the one I'm uh, going to talk about, we're looking interested in the link between family socioeconomic uh, status and school absenteeism. So the main uh, uh, approach we used was first to do a systematic review uh, of the literature. And our main finding from that systematic review was that majority of studies found a negative association between family SES and uh, school uh, uh, absences. So children from more affluent uh, SES background were less likely to be uh, absent uh, uh, from school. Or on the other hand, you could say those from more disadvantaged backgrounds were more likely to be absent uh, uh, from school. Although the effect sizes were uh, generally uh, uh, small, there was also a greater evidence for a link between uh, school absenteeism and those SES measures which were at the family level. So when you were lo looking at family level SES measures such as uh, free school, meals, parental education, the link was much more stronger than looking at school neighborhood socioeconomic indicators. So those macro level socioeconomic indicators had, uh, uh, were less likely to be associated than these family level uh, socioeconomic indicators. Another thing we found uh, from that uh, uh, research was that financial resources such as free or reduced price lunch was more strongly associated with uh, school absences than parental education, which was more indicative of sociocultural uh, resources. However, we also identified a, a lot of gaps only five out of the 55 studies we re uh, reviewed from high income uh, uh, country context uh, 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 came from outside a US context. So almost majority of these studies came from a US uh, uh, context. And free and reduced price lines was the most predominant uh, socioeconomic indicator that was uh, uh, used. And very few studies actually examined more than one socioeconomic status dimension in their uh, analysis. And uh, another interesting finding was that very few uh, studies investigated uh, the reasons why SES was associated with uh, uh, school attendance, the mechanisms by which SES linked to uh, uh, school absenteeism. So for our empirical study, we were uh, interested in whether or not there are socioeconomic inequalities in school absences within a Scottish context. We were also interested in uh, uh, knowing whether inequalities differ by the SES dimension. So for our studies, we use free school meal registration, parental class measures, parental education and neighborhood deprivation, as well as housing status. So we use a much more comprehensive measure of socioeconomic uh, 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 status. 
We were also interested in knowing whether the association between uh, SES and absences differ across uh, reasons for absences. So we are interested in more precise reasons such as truancies, sickness, absences, family holidays, as well as temporary exclusion. And we're also interested in finding out whether these associations uh, are similar across uh, uh, people's sex or place of residence in terms of rural and urban uh, uh, residency. So just to give a, a very quick uh, context on uh, uh, me me measurement of uh, school absences uh, in Scotland. So schools in Scotland report specific reasons for absences following guidelines by the Scottish uh, uh, government. So authorized reasons are those where parents actually contact the school and provide reasons why the child is not going to be uh, at school. Otherwise, this is recorded as a truanting until an explanation is provided and schools make contact with parents or with guardians to actually find out the reason why uh, individuals are not in school. For our study, we looked at overall absences, truancy and sickness absences, and these were measured as proportion of half days and for family holidays and temporary exclusion, we mainly uh, define this as whether people miss school as a result of these particular uh, reasons without taking the proportion into account. So our main findings for overall absenteeism was that each of the socioeconomic measures that we had was independently and uniquely associated with school absenteeism. So if you look at SIMD uh, here, individuals from the most deprived households were more likely to be absent from school, uh, uh, taking into account or in reference to those from the least deprived households. And if you take parental education, it's the same trend you, uh, you find. So families, uh, children from uh, households where parents had no educational qualification were more likely to be absent compared to a reference group, which was parents uh, 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 with university degree. You find the same pattern for uh, measures of parental class, for housing tenure, whereby individuals who uh, came from socially rented households were more likely to be absent overall than uh, those who were uh, uh, from uh, uh, who were renting from the private sector or had their own uh, uh, properties. And also with free school meals, those on free, uh, free school meals were more likely to be absent uh, compared to individuals who are not registered for free school. So we, we find this strong association, unique association, irrespective of the measures uh, we use. And just to say for uh, colleagues who might be asking, but this may be uh, uh, multi-collinear because they may be measuring the same thing. These, there are association between all these SES measures but those associations are different. They are not strong enough to say they are measuring the same things. So they are measuring uh, different things. The other thing uh, we were interested in was whether these associations were the same or uh, were different ac across uh, uh, student sex or uh, rural urban areas. And we find that these associations were similar overall irrespective of uh, sex of the pupils and irrespective of whether they came, they lived in a rural or urban uh, uh, setting. We also looked at this for all other forms of absent, uh, 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 all the specific reasons for absences and the patterns were quite similar. So for example, for sickness related absences, we find parental education, housing and free school meal as very important. For, uh, uh, for truancy, we find education, parental education, parental class, and uh, 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 housing tenure. And for temporary exclusion, we find um, uh, uh, neighborhood deprivation, education, housing, and free school meal as uh, associated uh, with uh, temporary exclusion. The only difference was with uh, family holidays where the associations were actually uh, non-existent. So the key point uh, here is that the findings generally confirm previous studies in, uh, in other contexts, mainly from a US uh, perspective. The unique findings from our study as already uh, highlighted was that all SES dimensions increase the risk of absenteeism from school. And the multiple SES dimensions were associated with specific forms of absences, which is sickness, absences, truancy, temporary exclusion, and the only exception being family holidays. 
and pupils from socially rented households and households with no qualification are the most likely to be absent and, and consistently associated with specific forms of absenteeism. So if we look at all these uh, individual uh, forms of absenteeism, the most consistent socioeconomic indicator associated with these uh, forms of absences were parental education, as well as whether or not uh, individuals were in uh, a socially rented uh, accommodation. And the associations between SES and absenteeism did not vary uh, by people uh, sex or, uh, uh, or area of residence. One thing we did was to extend uh, this analysis after schools reopen, uh, uh, after the first uh, lockdown of the COVID uh, 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 restrictions. And what we did was to look at school attendance uh, uh, overall and to look at these attendance differences between individuals from the most deprived and the least deprived uh, households. And this was data drawn from uh, uh, data published by the uh, Scottish government. What we found interestingly was that attendance was stratified by both COVID as well as uh, uh, non-COVID related reasons. So we find a gap in attendance due to COVID reasons, as well as non-COVID reasons. And these are uh, uh, these graphs here. And then we look at the risk difference. What this tells us overall is, is that there is an increase in, there has been an increasing gap in school attendance between those from the most and those from the least deprived household. That has quite implications for thinking uh, ahead in terms of how we uh, address a long-term uh, impact of, of the COVID-19 on, on, on learners. And we also realized that this increase in, uh, in the risk of uh, 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 non-attendance was due to both, uh, uh, was not only, uh, was not purely due to COVID-related reasons, and that this uh, increase was also due to non-COVID reasons. So, why? We do not know, but it tells us something that the lockdown has had an impact on, uh, on attendance overall and something that we need to attend to. So just some key, key point there that socioeconomic inequalities in learning is likely to increase not only during the COVID school closure, which is something that has been highlighted quite a lot, but continued to or likely to continue to increase after children return to school due to uh, school absences. And then we need to therefore uh, uh, pay a greater attention to monitoring and evaluating uh, trends in inequality, both in learning and achievement, as well as school attendance uh, 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 going forward. And also try to monitor the interventions that are designed to mitigate these consequences. So what are the overall implications from this particular study? That school absenteeism is a likely mechanism for the socioeconomic inequalities in educational attainment and life, life course outcomes because being in school is associated with being able to learn, and which is what Marcus will focus on in a subsequent presentation. We also uh, highlighted that targeted interventions are needed to reduce school absences among children from lower socioeconomic background if the goal is to close the educational attainment gap, because we know that that is one source of uh, inequality and uh, directly linked to uh, learning outcomes. Importantly, we need to improve family socioeconomic conditions, or we need to include the improvement in uh, family socioeconomic condition as a key component of all interventions to increase school attendance. If the main uh, cause for inequalities in school attendance is socioeconomic conditions, then we need to address that. So that is quite something that, is, uh, that needs to be taken into account. And there's also a need for designing interventions that are tailored to subgroups because we are finding these differences by forms of absences as well as by forms of socioeconomic status. So we need to be more nuanced in interventions around uh, uh, in increasing school attendance. And this could be at a personalized level combined with whole school approaches. And we also, particularly within a Scottish context where a lot of decision is driven by neighborhood uh, uh, data, neighborhood statistics or neighborhood poverty, need to think about using a much more holistic measure of socioeconomic indicators. Otherwise we will miss, or we will miss a lot of children who may not be captured by these uh, uh, indicators. 
This is just a generalized disclaimer for the data use and some references. Thank you very much. Now we um, can move on um, to Laura, Laura Robertson from the uh, Poverty Alliance. Would you like to pick up the, the, uh, the challenge now? Thank you, Donald. It is a bit of a challenge and I won't take up too much time talking because I want to hear more from Edward and Marcus about the research. And yeah, I've had um, the chance during the course of the project as an, an, an academic partner to, to hear the, the findings and it's um, yeah, such an important and, and timely um, research project. It's really interesting to hear about the longer term impacts on differences in attendance. Um, from COVID, um, I'm, yeah, it's a particularly interesting finding. So um, yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm a senior research officer at the Poverty Alliance. Uh, for those who haven't heard of us, we are um, Scotland's anti-poverty network organisation. Um, we consist of a membership base of around 400 individuals and organisations who share um, our role mission to, to challenge and end poverty in, in Scotland. Um, I'm going to just share some slides that I put together today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be focusing um, on a research that we've been conducting at the Poverty Alliance and um, commissioned by the Robertson Trust on um, the poverty attainment gap in Scotland before um, going on to discuss what I think some of the key implement, uh, implications are from, um, from the research findings that uh, Edward shone a light on so far. So in terms of um, what the attainment gap looks like in Scotland, I thought it'd be helpful to um, share some of the findings from a review of the poverty related attainment gap that was published by the Poverty Alliance in February 2021. So as part of that re review, we were looking at what the attainment gap looks like at different stages of the learner journey in Scotland. Um, and the Scottish Government published um, statistics examining performance levels um, based on the national curriculum um, and looking at national qualifications in the senior phase of school as well. Um, so this data clearly shows that um, the poverty attainment gap um, is an ongoing issue in Scotland, um, despite uh, policy focus on it, particularly since the, the Scottish Attainment Challenge was introduced in 2015. So you can see that infants from deprived areas in Scotland are 14% more likely to, uh, to display developmental concerns um, at age 27 to 30 months in comparison to um, infants in the least deprived areas in Scotland. And moving into um, primary school, there's a 20% uh, percentage point gap in literacy and uh, numeracy levels between young people, uh, between children living in the most and least deprived areas. And then moving on to um, when um, young people complete a higher level qualifications, um, only two in five young people from deprived areas um, achieve one or more hires compared to four in five in the least deprived areas. And I should say some of these stats um, predate COVID. So um, yes, there's um, due to be an update on, on some of these stats. So the picture um, based on research, which has shown that the gap is um, widening is likely um, to, to only get worse. Um, so in terms of uh, groups of children, young people most affected by the attainment gap, we also um, analysed the data to, to look at specific groups who are, who are most likely to be affected um, and this is all covered in, in our review, but yeah, there's particular groups of, of, of children, young people um, that responses need to be targeted at. So that includes white boys who live in deprived areas um, who are less likely to um, achieve expected levels in um, literacy and numeracy in, in primary school and qualifications um, in secondary school compared um, to their uh, black and minority ethnic peers also living in the 20s. 20% most deprived areas. Um, other groups particularly affected by the attainment gap include gypsy travellers and, and care experienced learners and young people with additional support needs. So I wanted to um, take the opportunity to reflect on what the qualitative evidence um, 
has uh, shown us about the impacts of COVID on, on poverty and attainment in Scotland. Um, and a key finding um, from research that we've been und undertaking at the Poverty Alliance um, as part of our Get Heard Scotland programme of research, um, as well as others, has uh, been the stark rise in educational inequalities as um, a consequence of um, the pandemic. So our research um, as part of Get Heard Scotland um, found that families uh, with children with additional support needs in particular struggle to access um, education as well as support um, outside of school as well during the pandemic. Um, our research also um, shone a light on the challenges experienced by low income families um, during lockdowns and also when children and young people return to school. Um, particularly around um, a lack of access to digital um, devices with many families we spoke to not having any access or having one device that needed to be shared um, by two or more children. Um, there's also been a lot of work done by um, Child Poverty Action Group as part of their Cost of the School Day programme, which has highlighted some of the hidden costs um, associated with being um, able to fully participate in education for low-income families in Scotland. Um, so for many families, there's a range of challenges around managing costs, um, which have longer term in, um, impacts on outcomes for children and young people. Um, for example, earlier this week, um, CPAC uh, published a report on, um, entitled The Cost of Having Fun at School, um, which highlighted that young people who are living in poverty aren't able to take part in wider um, activities uh, within school and teachers reported that uh, pupils are living in poverty are often missing um, events like non-uniform and dress up days um, due to the financial costs and, and family pressures around these kind of things. Um, another area that I wanted to reflect on was around um, mental health, the impacts um, of COVID um, on um, yeah, increasing anxiety and depression of, of children and young people. And there's a project being conducted by academics at Edinburgh University, which has specifically looked at whether there's been additional impacts on mental health um, for young people who um, might be identified as vulnerable. And they've found that young people have been experiencing new and additional vulnerabilities as a result of the pandemic. And there's been wider research to show um, that young people um, marginalised young people have um, struggled with returning to school um, since um, post lockdown. So briefly, very briefly, um, I want to touch on some of the current policy responses um, to tackling the attainment gap in Scotland. Um, so I thought I'd touch on a few different things. So, um, so Scotland is the only part of the UK um, to have set targets um, to cut child poverty. And just last week, the new Tackling Child Poverty um, Delivery Plan was published by the Scottish Government. Um, it was particularly focused around increasing incomes through Social Security, as well as, uh, well as on um, funding to provide support and to employment um, for parents. Um, and there's um, some things to look out uh, for from the, from the new delivery plan. So um, they've, uh, the Scottish Government has promised that it will uh, provide access to digital devices for all school-aged children by 2026. Um, and um, they also make reference to a new youth work strategy, um, which uh, will be published soon. Um, additionally, there is an ongoing review by the Education, Children and Young People's um, Committee on the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Um, the Scottish the attainment challenge um, began in 2015 and it's um, previously gone through a, a review, but this is an update to see really um, how it has worked in terms of addressing the attainment gap, what has worked well um, and what could be improved. And the committee will be publishing their findings um, from that review at some point in, in the coming months. Um, and lastly, there's been a, a big focus on education and education recovery. Um, and COVID by the Scottish Government, um, particularly funding to um, improve access to mental health and wellbeing support within schools. Um, and also um, you'll see here a 19 million fund to support the rollout of mentoring provision by the MCR Pathways 
programme as well as um, supporting a leadership um, programme as well. So yeah, just to, to reflect on implications for policy and practice um, from uh, Edward and Marcus's research and um, from Poverty Alliance's perspective. Um, so for us, initiatives, um, interventions, approaches to support um, children and young people um, impacted by the attainment gap um, need to be provided both within and outside of school settings. Um, as Edward mentioned, um, there's uh, clear evidence on whole school approaches within schools, what can be done um, in terms of high quality teaching, school leadership um, to address the attainment gap. Um, but that needs to ensure that there's also targeted uh, responses to support children and young people and to meet individual needs. Um, so, for example, we um, undertook research with children and young people in Fife a few years ago who um, are on part-time timetables um, and we asked them what some of the barriers were for them um, attending school on a full-time basis. And for many of them, it could be something um, uh, as simple uh, seeming as um, not enjoying a particular subject or attending a specific class. Um, but um, it was a challenge for schools to kind of work out how to respond to the, that kind of specific thing. So there's more that needs to be done to make sure um, that time in school is working for, for children and young people. Um, there's also a need, as um, Edward alluded to, for targeted interventions uh, for children and young people. Um, and there's a lot of evidence out there published by um, the Education Endowment Foundation, for example, on um, approaches and interventions that will have, are likely to have the most positive impact on attainment. So um, recently we uh, published a report on the use of mentoring and tutoring for young people and, and the Poverty Alliance have uh, recommended the rollout of free tutoring provision for children and young people living in poverty in Scotland. Um, as well as this, um, there's a need for greater investment in programmes which address the impact of poverty. So there is a lot of good practice out there. So I referenced um, the Child Poverty Action Group's um, Cost of the School Day programme. There's also initiatives at local authority level, for example, um, a programme in Edinburgh called Maximise, which delivers um, advice around social security within school settings um, to parents. Um, so there could be more work done to ensure that families have um, access to that kind of support within the school, um, within the school setting. Um, and I've also uh, referenced here consistent and longer term funding for uh, third sector organisations. So there's a lot of um, really um, key support that's been provided um, to young people living in poverty across Scotland um, by third sector organisations. And there, yeah, there's a need for that to be more sustainable um, and um, also to have more consistency around what services are available um, in which local authorities across um, Scotland. Uh, but just to finish off, um, I just want to emphasise that this is not an issue um, that schools alone can address. Um, there is a need to, yeah, to build a strong infrastructure um, around families, around schools, around communities. Um, the focus needs to be on large scale change um, rather than just on individual targeted interventions um, to ensure that um, yeah, there's a continued focus on tackling poverty in Scotland. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to call upon uh, Marcus. Marcus Klein is going to lead off the second half. Um, and uh, so I'll pass over to you, Marcus. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. So in the first part of our project, we found that there are significant socioeconomic inequalities in school absenteeism in the Scottish context. We also discussed that these inequalities in, in absences have widened after the COVID-19 related school closures. Now the question is whether these inequalities have consequences for children's educational and labour market outcomes in Scotland. And uh, our presentation here is divided into three parts. In the first part, we will consider the association between school absenteeism and academic achievement. The second part will, will highlight findings on the association between school absences and post-school destinations. 
And in the final part, we will discuss possible implications for policy and practice. If we consider this figure again, um, we focus on this link between absences and achievement. So only if school absences are harmful to children's ed educational achievement, they contribute to SAS achievement gaps. And this is what we wanted to find out. Our findings are based on two research outputs. One paper has just recently been published. The other paper is currently under review and investigates whether the link between absences and achievement varies across socioeconomic groups. Before I summarize the findings, I wanted to provide some motivation for our study. So there is robust evidence from US literature that school absenteeism is harmful to academic achievement, such as test scores and grades. However, in our view, there is hardly any literature on Europe or the UK. Many studies in the US context also focused on absences and achievement in primary education. Most studies did not differentiate between different reasons for absence. They considered overall absences in a given school year. There is a, a small literature that investigated authorized versus unauthorized absences. And while both types of absences have been found to be harmful to achievement, unauthorized absences were more detrimental than authorized absences. However, we think that there may be a lot of heterogeneity hidden within these larger categorizations of absences, and it would be advantageous to consider more precise reasons such as sickness or truancy. And investigating more precise reasons may inform us about the potential causes of lower achievement aside from learning loss. It is also important because understanding why absences are harmful to achievement will also allow us to create more targeted, again, interventions to mitigate the negative consequences of absences. As shown in our first presentation, um, children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to be absent from school than children from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. But lower SAS students may also face a double disadvantage. They are not only more likely absent, but being absent is also more harmful to them than to high SAS students. And this could be because lower SAS families do not have the resources to compensate for the lost learning. There is again a small literature that considered whether the link between absences and achievement varies across socioeconomic groups. However, these findings are inconclusive and again focused on the US context. This research is also, has also mainly used a single SAS dimension, such as free or reduced price lunch, to test for variation across groups. So given these identified gaps in the literature, we have three research questions in this part. The first research question is, does school absenteeism have an adverse impact on academic achievement at the end of compulsory and post-compulsory schooling? Second research question asks, does the effect vary depending on the form of absenteeism considered? And here we look at very detailed reasons such as sickness absence, exceptional domestic circumstances, family holidays, and truancy. And the third question asks, does the association between school absenteeism and academic achievement vary across multiple SAS dimensions? And to answer these questions, we use again the sample of the Scottish Longitudinal Study described in the first part of our presentation. So how do we measure academic achievement in Scotland? We used information from national high stakes examinations in S4 and S5 to 6, provided by the Scottish Qualifications Authority. The nature of the examinations in Scotland is quite complex. Students can choose to sit exams in any number of subjects at any level. Therefore, we summarized achievement with a continuous measure, the unified point score scale. This is an extended version of the UK Scottish tariff point system has been widely used in reports by the Scottish government. Overall and specific forms of absences are measured as the proportion of days a pupil was absent in S4 and in S5. The measure in S5, S4 is used for the analysis on achievement at the end of S4. The measure in S5 is used for the analysis on achievement at the end of S6. Specific forms of absences include sickness absence, truancy, exceptional domestic circumstances, and family holidays. 
Exceptional domestic circumstances include, for instance, family bereavement or any other circumstances which are distressing to, to the pupil. The family SS measures are the same that we used in the previous presentation. So we use parental class based on the national socioeconomic classification, parental education, housing tenure, and free school meal registration. We also include a list of other variables in our modeling measuring sociodemographic and health characteristics. So let's look at the results. In this figure, you can see the effect sizes for overall absences and different forms of absences from linear regressions predicting achievement in S4 and S5 or 6. These findings are based on two different models, including either overall absences or the specific forms altogether. The model on achievement in S6 is 5 or 6, additionally controls for previous academic achievement in S4. The effect sizes are shown in standardized tariff points. So for instance, if you consider the effect of truancy on achievement in S4, we can say that a one percentage point increase in days absent due to truancy on average decreases the tariff point by 4% of a standard deviation, holding all other variables constant. You can see that overall and specific forms of absences have a negative impact on achievement at both stages. All effects are statistically significant since the 95% confidence intervals do not extend beyond the zero line. You can also see that the effects of different reasons do not vary significantly as most confidence intervals overlap. In a further robustness check, um, we estimated the effect of within student changes in absence from S4 to S5 on their academic achievement progress from, from compulsory to post-compulsory schooling. We were able to confirm the harmful consequences of overall and specific forms of abs absences, except for family holidays. In the next step, we considered whether the effects of overall absences, truancy and sickness on achievement vary across socioeconomic groups. We found no discernible differences in the association between overall absences and academic achievement across SAS groups. Contrary to what we believed in, school absences were equally harmful to all pupils. We found the same pattern when considering truancy. Only for sickness absence, we found evidence for a stronger negative impact on achievement among pupils from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. We found statistically significant differences in the effect of sickness absence on achievement for social class, free school meal registration and housing tenure, but not for parental education. So let me briefly summarize this research. So in line with US findings, we found that school absences overall are detrimental to student achievement in Scotland. Absences due to truancy, sickness, and exceptional domestic circumstances had unique adverse effects on students' achievement. It appears that unauthorized and authorized absences are equally harmful to student achievement. Our findings also should suggest that learning loss may not be the only reason why school absences harm pupils' academic achievement. For instance, absences due to sickness may signal the role of long-term underlying health conditions that negatively affect education achievement. School absences associated with truancy could exacerbate risky behaviors, such as substance abuse or delinquency that in turn then cause lower academic achievement. And finally, school absences may not only be harmful to uh, learning loss, but it may also reduce interactions with peers and teachers, leading to less integration in the school environment and maybe a feeling of alienation in, in school. Uh, and again, this may be then detrimental to their achievement. Overall absences and truancy are equally harmful to all children, no matter their socioeconomic background. And this suggests that high SAS is generally not a protective factor when it comes to mitigating the consequences of school absences. However, high SAS pupils recover more quickly from learning loss due to sickness absence. We can only speculate why this is the case. <clears throat> it could be that the type of sickness um, absence is different across SAS groups and high SAS pupils face fewer underlying health conditions. 
It could also be that there is greater school support in affluent areas to catch up with missed lesson content. And finally, high SAS um, families may leverage assets to help their children with missed learning. Now in the following, I will present some work on the link between school absenteeism and post-school destinations. And this is based on a paper that is not finalized yet, but it is close to submitting it to a journal. A little, a little bit of background um, on this paper. So there's widespread assumption that school absenteeism is a key vulnerability that likely locks young people into path dependency of disadvantaged life course trajectories. However, however, the school absenteeism literature, at least, at least what we have found, has mainly focused on schooling outcomes, such as academic achievement, dropout, or exclusion. Very few studies look beyond school and consider longer term outcomes, such as post-school destinations. If there are studies, um, they do not examine the different reasons for absenteeism and its link to post-school destinations. In addition, studies did not investigate why school absences are linked to post-school destinations. And we aim to fill this research gap by addressing three research questions. In the first question we ask, are school absences differently associated with post-school destinations, depending on the reason for absence, truancy, sickness, absence, and um, our school absence, um, up, and the, the third, that was the second question. The first question is, are school absences in upper secondary education associated with students' post-school destinations? And I should say something about um, what we mean by post-school destinations. So the first indicator we use is not employment, education or training need. The second indicator is um, occupational attainment. The third question asks, to what extent does academic achievement explain the association between school absences and post-school destinations? Let's have a look again at the results. So in this table, you can see the total effect and the direct effect of school absences net of achievement on the risk of being in not employment, education or training. You can also see the percentage of the total effect that is explained by achievement. And effect sizes are shown as average marginal effects which multiplied by 100 can be interpreted as percentage point difference so it's in the probability of being need. For instance, um, if you look at this effect, the total effect of overall absences indicates that a one percentage point increase in absences on average increases the probability of being need by 0.3 percentage points, holding all other variables constant. And as you can see, all total effects for overall truancy and sickness are statistically significant at conventional criteria. This is also true for the direct effects of overall um, absence and sickness absence, accounting for academic achievement, but not for the direct effect of truancy. What you can also see that is 36% of the effect of overall absences on the risk of being need can be attributed to differences in academic achievement. It is 29% for sickness, and half of the association for truancy. Okay. So let me sum up, summarize these results. Overall and specific reasons for absence increase the risk of being need. Overall and sickness uh, absences also increase the risk of being need net of academic achievement. So this means that school absences have negative consequences on labor market outcomes that cannot be attributed to pupils' academic achievement. The extent to which achievement explains the greater risk of being, being need varies across the reasons for absence. It is stronger for truancy and weaker for sickness absence. We also found a no discernible effect of overall absences and the specific reasons on occupational attainment among those employed. This means that harmful effects of school absences are restricted to the exclusion from participation in the labor market or in further education. Now I'm coming to the implications. <clears throat> so what are the possible implications of this research on school absence and academic achievement and post-school destinations? So first I would say um, school absences and various reasons are harmful to achievement among all pupils. And this suggests that it is difficult to mitigate the consequences of school absences for schooling, no matter pupils' backgrounds. 
Um, if you are absent, it, it has negative consequences for achievement, no matter children's background. Um, the second argument could be made that school absenteeism contributes to SAS achievement gaps. We found strong links between SAS and absences and absences and achievement. Therefore, it is worthwhile to put more emphasis on reducing absenteeism, particularly among children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Sickness absence is particularly problematic because we didn't only find socioeconomic disparities in sickness absence, but also that sickness absence causes greater harm for learning and achievement among low SS students. And typically, public debate focuses more on unauthorized absences, such as truancy. Our findings suggest that policy and practice should maybe pay equal attention to the determinants and consequences of unauthorized and authorized absences. Apart from reducing absenteeism as a, as a goal of policy, interventions should be concerned with mitigating lost learning for absent pupils, particularly where absence cannot be avoided as in the case of sickness absence. This could be done by providing um, additional school support via tutoring, it could be during and, up and after school, or by strengthening parental involvement in schooling at home. For instance, by providing clear guidance for parents on how their children can catch up with missed uh, lesson content. Given our findings on post-school destinations, we also believe that frequently absent students need career support, either providing, by providing access to further education or by providing help in integrating into the labor market. We need to minimize the harmful effect of school absences on individuals' uh, life courses. And finally, um, maybe a comment on data availability. Our analysis were restricted to the senior secondary stages, since these are the only stages for which we can access information on student achievement. It would be ben beneficial to have access to reliable achievement data before these stages to better understand the link between absences and achievement, and also between SAS and achievement early in children's school career. Okay, this is again the disclaimer, the references. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Marcus for that. Um, some more food for thought, um, but we'll hold the questions for now because we're going to hear also from Joe Robinson, uh, who's here. Good to see you, Joe. Um, uh, who's here representing um, the GTCS um, and um, in her role there. And um, yeah, I'll pass the baton on to you then, Jill, to pick it up and, and run with that. Okay. Thank you very much, Donald. Sure, thank you. And, and thank you, Edward and Marcus. That is really fascinating. And Laura, um, can I say I've not prepared a presentation to do. I'm not here to um, uh, to present on behalf of the GTC, but more as when I spoke with Edward, more about actually having a discursive conversation about about the research and in terms of what that means. And I hope that that fits in with the with the plan. So thank you very much for sharing this thought-provoking and indeed Timius work um, from the beginning of an important, and I think it is the beginning of an important research journey. I, I, I'm very much, although you've done an enormous amount of work, it certainly to me seems the beginning of an important research journey from which I think we will learn a great deal <clears throat> into how we can um, might best support our children and young people to thrive in the present but for and in the futures as well. Now for me, your research raises a number of key systemic issues for consideration. Particularly noteworthy is that your research recognises some of the super complexity at play. And I wonder if that is something that could perhaps be mapped out and actually um, made visual or made more obvious in terms of actually just seeing how complex and indeed how super complex um, this whole issue is. And um, crucially for me, um, 
uh, uh, from the teaching profession is that you identify it would be folly to imagine or even to hope that schools alone will be able to address the problems you identify because they're being related so significantly to socioeconomic factors. That said, I'm really confident that uh, staff in schools, although they may not be surprised by your findings because they're dealing with it day to day, they will certainly welcome re the recognition that the ongoing operational work that they are doing and their attempts to reduce absence um, and ameliorate the effects of that is on its own not going to be enough. Um, the Scottish Government's recognition of the need for a strategic, meaningful, actionable and wholly systemic approach to closing the gap is most welcome and Laura outlined some of the um, indicators of that. Um, and I just wondered, it, it brings me, I have a few comments to make, but also a few questions to pose, and you may just want to log these just now. I don't know if you want to engage in the discussion at this moment, but I wondered, um, Edward and Marcus, what opportunities are there for you to engage with other key players in the system to be able to expand this beyond and involve from the outset those different perspectives and different actions? Okay, I, I can take that. Uh, so a really uh, a, a good question. And uh, we think this forum is one of the uh, starting, uh, is the starting point for uh, engaging with uh, partners and with, a, with yourself, GTCS, that work with schools and with teachers and with Poverty Alliance that works mainly with families. I think that it's a very uh, interesting starting point. We've also uh, been in touch with uh, colleagues in Education Scotland, as well as Scottish government, some of whom are represented uh, here. And I can see from the chat, some other colleagues like uh, Alex uh, highlighting uh, the need for collaboration. And I know his work is in England and the opportunity to expand that, uh, that discourse. And we'll uh, welcome uh, suggestions around how to take much of uh, this collaboration uh, uh, forward. Yeah, I think we see this project as, a, as, a, as you said, as a first starting point, we need to have a descriptive overview of these relationships. And then with uh, non-academic partners, we can maybe then dig deeper into those complexities. Uh, someone in the chat mentioned, of course, uh, qualitative work. Yeah, so this, this quantitative work could be a starting point for further qualitative work. It could also be starting for point for interventions. At the moment, we are um, doing a systematic review of existing interventions to reduce absenteeism to give an overview. And uh, yeah, um, one aim, of course, in the long run could be to run interventions um, ourselves in, in collaboration with schools and, and other partners. Fascinating, thank you. Um, and I think that would be really useful, which brings me to, to the next point. Uh, I think this is a particularly opportune time um, to be looking at something as fundamental as this that raises such big questions. Given the current context of um, the Muir report and the potential for an education debate and so on. Now, particularly in, in GTC at the moment, we're actually engaging with the profession um, to consider ethical dimensions of teaching and looking at a contemporary code, the production or the creation, should I say, of a contemporary code. And of course, that then raises big questions about what does, what does contemporary teacher professionalism actually mean? How are we living that out? Um, and I think this is a, one of the fundamental questions that comes out when you begin to look at ethical dimensions of uh, education and professionalism and what that actually means, is asking the fundamental question of education for what and whose purposes. 
And I think actually starting with that and really beginning to tease that out and then what are the implications for us um, in the education system? And for me, when I was reading your research, that came over quite strongly. Um, education for what and whose purposes. And okay, understandably, we're measuring the, the impact on these young people in terms of attainment and, um, and thereafter. But I do wonder um, the the other implications, the social implications that are raised with all of that, um, which raises the question of qualitative, um, the qualitative aspect that you've identified as important. And I wondered what opportunities you feel there would be perhaps to speak with teachers, with head teachers, um, in terms of their perspective on it, with parents themselves, and of course, with young people. I'll, I'll leave that as a, as a question just to, to hang for the moment, if that's OK, because what I wanted to um, offer, if you like, is this idea of multi-level possibilities and qualitative um, actually using our, and, um, and engaging with schools and what they are doing in terms of practitioner inquiry in schools. Many schools will be conducting practitioner inquiry and not the kind of what works small test of change inquiry that just either sets out to prove or test something, but actually goes out to deeply understand the young people with whom they're working with and the conditions and the um, factors that are affecting them. And I am confident that there will be um, colleagues working in the profession who are doing that kind of inquiry, who are actually engaging one to one with young people to investigate and explore how um, the provision might be made better. Um, and part of that, uh, part of our work in the GTC, of course, is making connections with teachers who are doing that. Um, these kind of um, inquiries, but also with head teachers um, who are trying to take a whole school systemic approach. And interestingly, I was speaking to one head teacher this morning from Banff Academy, Alan Horbury, um, who has taken a very, very different approach in um, the way that he, the lens through which he's looking at school and very much from an ethical reasoning point of view saying, why am I educating? Yes, I can push attainment and raise attainment, but actually for what and whose purposes is that? And looking much more through the lens of health and well-being, which is fascinating. Now, of course, that doesn't just mean it's changed the lens of how they're looking at education in Banff Academy, it's actually changed the whole structure and the way that they support their young people. So instead of having a, um, five or six guidance teachers across the um, school, they now have 56 teachers engaged with one to 12 pupils. Um, and that is, a, that is um, a mechanism through which you might get to the bottom or you might get to ways of, of working with young people to, to challenge absence. So basically it was just to flag up the possibilities that there are schools out there doing something very contextually specific, but, but not pretending, as you identified Edward, that one um, blanket kind of intervention, intervention is going to work. And when you mentioned the idea of the importance of systemic change, we're talking about the systemic change within the school as well, that that means the whole system, which Alan has changed in, in, in Banff Academy. Um, so it was just really bringing those big questions, if you like, for education for what and whose purposes, but it always comes back down to um, those key things that Laura picked up on, the idea of relationships and mentoring and the importance of who we are in our own context. So that's just a little starter. Can, can I just comment? Before um, leaving um, the other presenters time to digest that question, I'll just co comment on something in relation to this. Um, and it also flags you, you're, I know you're not here representing the GTC um, as such, but the fact that you are, you know, uh, um, involved in, in the work of the GTC, a very important development this year, of course, was the um, 
the refreshment and republishing um, of the professional standards. Um, and I think it's fair to say that in the, the, the most recent uh, iteration, that the professional standards um, are, are very, very strongly emphasizing social justice. It has a more prominent focus within the standards. And um, to me, what that suggests is that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very uh, keen advocate of um, the kinds of standards we've got in Scotland for the, the profession, because I believe they're, they can be very um, formative and, um, um, you know, kind of a positive influence on um, the kind of context that we're in, informing dialogue and discussion discussion about what we should be prioritizing. So um, in my mind, um, it does provide a, a broader context for the kinds of things that are being called for today in response to the specific challenges that we have in relation to the poverty related attainment gap, that it, this does fit within a, um, a kind of wholesale commitment. Uh, we see it from in government policy, we see it at the professional level and we see it in the research community. Um, so this is an important part of the context, part of the fabric within which we have to operate and, um, you know, try to introduce the kind of interventions that are being called for here by the research. My pen is worth. <laughs> I, th I think that's absolutely right, Donald, and it's one of those classic situations when you're so involved in the, the standards, for example, you, you kind of don't think, but you're absolutely right how, how strong values underpins that. Um, for me, the key thing there, of course, is not the documentation itself, it's the way in which we support the profession to engage and explore the standards and bring them to life because they're only words on a page. It is our, our colleagues in the profession who actually make sense. And that's where I, I, I believe that you'll get a great deal of richness and, and um, suggestions or, or possibilities for moving ahead from that because they are living those values day to day and constantly adapting um, to the complexities that, that, that they're fe being faced with. I think that's all I have to say at the moment. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Marcus or, or Edward wanted to respond to yeah, um, I, perhaps to what Jill was asking. I totally agree. Um, of course, we are we are driven by what um, is required, requested by the funder here. So this is uh, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council Secondary Data Analysis Initiative. So that means um, the way we conduct research is restricted by the funding that we got. Um, the aim here was to exploit the data we have in the Scottish context by using this very valuable Scottish longitudinal study, which has not been used for education purposes to a great extent, to use this data sets to provide a broad picture of these relationships that we, 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 are, we were talking about. Of course, um, this is a very narrow view on achievement in post-school destinations, and I agree that we need to look at wider outcomes and health and well-being, uh, mental health and so on and so forth. That is of course also related to school absences. I think we will dig a little bit deeper at, again from a quantitative point of view in our, our follow-up project where we want to look at um, the effects of school absenteeism on children's dispositions that could be um, externalizing, internalizing behavior, uh, self-esteem, their aspirations, educational aspirations, labor market aspirations. So this will come in a follow-up project. But I totally agree that um, we should not restrict ourselves to a quantitative um, way of doing research. It has to be, um, it has to be um, widened to a qualitative um, point of view. And you mentioned practitioner inquiry and talking to, to teachers and head teachers is definitely something that is, is planned uh, for the future. And um, it's just that um, for this particular project, there was a clear aim of using those data for the first time for education purposes. So, thanks very much, Jill. And I think you've provided some really interesting provocations. And I think 
the question you ask, which is the ethical dimension of you know what is the purpose of education in itself is a very uh, a good point and i would say my response to that is it's it again boils down to the point is you know an education for whom so if we have only some young people coming to school so is education being provided for everybody so that's the starting point of you know you know what's the purpose of education and who should education be provided for and then the question becomes for what purpose? And the, in this case, we're looking at achievement, but you are right that we can expand these to look at health and well-being outcomes and uh, other outcomes that are of interest. So I think these are really interesting perspectives that either ourselves or other researchers will be able to, uh, to take forward. So really appreciate that. Thank you. And I fully appreciate the, the, the restrictions of, of research funding. Um, but hopefully just being able to raise these, and I know it's been raised in the chat as well, that might give you um, extra, extra opportunities. Thank you so much. That's great. Okay. Um, we now come, um, I'm going to have to draw a, a close to the, the questions for the time being. Uh, um, although I think at the end there might be still a chance to chip chip in on on the on the chat, um, because we turn now um, to look at uh, the future plans that you have uh, for this research, um, and uh, I think I'm going to turn to Marcus to lead this section um, on future plans. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you. Um, Tom. Okay, um, just a quick outlook on what we have planned in the existing projects um, using secondary data analysis. Um, so our immediate aim is to consider relations between SAS school absences and academic achievement uh, more fully. Um, so what does that mean? We will look at, we will look at the whole picture. So at the moment, we only looked at um, family book background relationship to school absenteeism and the relationship between school absenteeism and education achievement. But we haven't looked at all these relationships together. So we know that um, school absenteeism contributes to the SAS achievement gap, but we don't know to what extent. So in, in this part of um, our analysis, we will look at to what extent school absenteeism explains SAS achievement gaps. Because we need to, for also um, policy and practice, it is important to know to what extent school absenteeism is important for the SAS achievement gaps. If we intervene in school absenteeism, is uh, our SAS achievement gaps strongly reduced or marginally reduced? And we, ca we can't answer that by what we have um, analyzed so far. So that will be the next step. We also did um, uh, currently do a systematic review of interventions to reduce absenteeism. And that can be, we are very open here, that can be any interventions that um, have been conducted in school or outside of school with families that try to reduce absenteeism. We also um, want to look at um, the relationship between school absences and dropout after compulsory schooling. It is highly likely that, um, of course, those students who are frequently absent from school will also more likely to drop out after compulsory schooling. And what I've presented today um, was the relationship between school absence and a summary measure of academic achievement in S4 and S5 and S6. But it may also be worthwhile to look at school absences and subject choices or subject specific performance, for instance, in English and math, and see whether maybe um, school absences are more detrimental to particular subjects than others. And uh, lastly, we want also want um, to look at um, determinants and consequences of tardiness. And um, while, of course, children and come to school at some point during the day, it may also be the case that tardiness has equally harmful 
effects on achievement or other outcomes than school absences. And we have um, data on um, tardiness available in those attendance uh, and exclusion data provided by the Scottish government. Now I've um, mentioned already a new um, project. This project is funded by the Nuffield Foundation. Um, it will start in May, um, it will run for two years. Uh, and we're the same team again as for the ESRC project, and we are currently in the process of hiring a new research associate. And the reason we have this project is that there is very few literature on the longer term consequences of school absenteeism that goes beyond education. And in the old project um, with the Scottish Longitudinal Study, we looked at post-school destinations, but these are immediate post-school destinations after leaving school. And we cannot look at um, you know, educational or labor market trajectories for a longer period of time. And this is the aim of um, this new project. We also want to investigate whether dispositions such as externalizing and internalizing behavior, self-esteem or educational and job aspirations explain these associations between school absences and educational labor and labor market outcomes. So here basically we, we focus on non-cognitive skills that may be underdeveloped by not going to school. So we do not focus on academic outcomes, but rather the, those soft skills we want to have a look at. And again, we want to examine whether these associations vary across um, social demographic characteristics. In this new project, we will um, extend our research also to England and Wales, um, using the British cohort study 1970, the Millennium Cohort Study, um, and the National Pupil Database for England and the Welsh Administrative Education Data that will be linked to those survey data, providing us with rich information on um, cognitive and non-cognitive skills, on absences and educational and labour market outcomes over a long period of time. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Um, thanks, Marcus. Uh, exciting for the research to come. Um, it falls to me to um, round things off and just um, bring the webinar to a, a close. Um, I think we've had a, a very rich offering today from all of the presenters, lots of food for thought. Um, and I think, you know, there are so many things I won't attempt to summarize what, what's been said in uh, over the past couple of hours but there are some key things I think um, that come come through strongly from this the importance of this kind of research detailed careful analysis um, really to examine the information that we have and we do have a rich source of, of data available to us in Scotland and we're very fortunate to have that but one thing we perhaps haven't had um, is sufficient expertise um, to interrogate that data in such a way that it sheds light on situations that are important to us. And I think we, you know, I would like to uh, pay tribute to Edward and Marcus um, because of the skills that they have, um, the, um, the in-depth statistical literacy that they um, are able to deploy, uh, which is actually um, among colleagues, um, perhaps in somewhat short supply, I have to say. But um, what is so important, of course, is that the analysis that's done is made accessible and um, then um, taken forward in a range of ways that really can make a difference. But I think providing that uh, analysis is such an important stage in the process, you know, so that uh, assumptions that might otherwise be made uh, can be questioned um, so that pra you know things that we choose sometimes to see as simple um, can can actually turn out to be a little bit more than simple in fact sometimes problematic um, and really behoving uh, careful further analysis so for example as is, um, uh, in examples today um, assumptions made about uh, the difference between 
um, authorized and unauthorized absence. Um, in fact, in some cases, um, actually both are uh, quite damaging and we shouldn't make uh, false assumptions. The problem, I think, uh, is, is quite common in education, that we look for simple solutions. Um, and anyone who come up with, it comes up with a, a, a very simple, you know, single solution uh, to, to, to the kinds of problems you face in education is in, invariably wrong because education is intrinsically complex um, and we must acknowledge that. But at the same time, not throwing up our hands and saying, well, it's so complex, we can't do anything about it. Of course, we have to do a lot, everything we can do. Um, education is a profoundly applied field and we need to be engaged in taking things forward in a way that really does make a difference um, and enhances children's lives and addresses the kinds of issues that we've um, talked about today. Um, a fundamental problem that has been so apparently intractable that the, the difference in, in um, po you know, the poverty related education attainment gap is, is such a, um, a, a, a thorny problem, but we must address uh, in all its complexity and we must take things forward as best we can. So um, uh, thanks to the presenters, um, to Marcus, to Edward, to Laura and to Jill. Um, and thanks to everyone who's participated today in, in what's been a, a very constructive, um, interesting session. Lots of good questions. Um, I think the, um, the, the plan is to um, make sure that we've recorded all of the, the whole thing is being recorded, I understand. Um, and um, that will be um, in so, it, various ways made available. Um, and um, the questions that have been lodged will, will also be uh, recorded and, and um, that will be kind of dealt with in, in due course and further dialogue, further conversations can take place on the basis of that. So thanks again to all the presenters and um, we look forward to uh, the next such event when you're ready to report on the uh, study that's about to begin. So thanks very much to everyone. Thank you, Donald, for Thank moderating you. this session. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. <laughs>